Welcome back to the world of Lindworm. My name is Hydra of the Dice Gods. So we've done the basics, we've done the fluff, we've even done some profiles, and now it's time to take a look at the most important of things, the rules. Thanks as ever to CCG Winkle for sponsoring this video. Don't forget you can register your pre-order with them now to ensure you get your copy of the Winds from the North Battle Box as soon as possible. You can find the link to the pre-order below and thanks to all of you who have placed your order already. We really appreciate the support. As the rulebook has yet to be released, today's video will be a heady cocktail of information we can glean from the Whispers of Lindworm videos, the few other videos out there, the profiles, and wild conjecture. So we'd encourage you to take this video as a guide to how the game might be, not exactly what it will be. As with our last video, a huge thanks to Swiss Miss Gaming for videoing their demo at Adepticon. Link to the video in the description, and if you haven't, go check it, give them some love. We're hoping to have some more solid information on the rules in the coming weeks, or most likely the detailed rules reveal trailer that will drop approximately 15 minutes before this video goes live. I see you CB. But until that happens, grab a plate of cheese, pour yourself the finest cup of tea, and let's check out Warcrow the Wargame. First, a quick recap. In our last video, we discussed that the game is played on a three foot by three foot board, has two players, and around 20 to 25 minis per player which we think comes at around 200 points. You sort initiative, and so who goes first, etc., based on a dice roll of one yellow and one orange dice. This may be modified by the command pips which your forced leader has on their card. Both Drago and Elbork have three pips, so there's no difference there. But if you have more pips, you add a dice into your roll, giving you a higher chance of success. As we've mentioned before, we wouldn't be surprised if these pips are also a resource which your commander can spend in-game to do stuff. Like the command token system in Infinity, which can be used for certain types of rerolls to form fire teams and things like that. The game itself is split into rounds, with each round being split into a set of turns. In each turn, a player may activate a single unit. This unit then does stuff. When the doing is done, play moves back to the other player, who activates one of their units. Back and forth it goes until we run out of turns. Note that the number of turns seems to be smaller than the number of units in a force, so you won't activate all of your units in a round. At the end of a round, a no one gets left behind phase lets each player move any units which didn't activate that turn. That phase complete, we start a new round and off we go again. We mentioned that turns are tracked on this guy. Interestingly, the circles on the outer track can contain tokens which can cause an event to happen during that turn. In the Swiss Miss demo, for example, a blizzard happens and each unit needed to test to ensure it didn't freeze to death. Now, I'm not usually a fan of random events. They annoy me. You have your army planned, they're on the board, ready to go, then a set of poor dice rolls robs you of a key piece or two. Not through any tactical error you made, it's just one of those things. It's infuriating. However, here I don't mind. In fact, I kind of like it. Warcrow is meant to be a rich narrative experience. These story beats feel right for how Corvus Belly are positioning this game. This isn't a hardcore tournament experience. This is you living in a different world. And yeah, I'm up for it. Now, let's get into the meat of the game. What does a turn look like? When it's your turn, you may activate any unit who has not been activated already in this round. Or you may activate a unit who has been activated already, but that unit then gains a stress token and is one step closer to running away. As I've mentioned stress tokens, let's talk about those for a minute. Stress tokens are accumulated through being activated twice, uh, to activate more aggressive attacks or stronger defense on some units, losing combat, and through the effect of certain skills and abilities. For example, the Northern Tribe's Evoker has a spell called Spirit of Thermopyrus, which gives the target, a friendly unit, the intimidating condition. This, reading through the spell, can cause an enemy to gain stress tokens. But why do stress tokens matter? On your unit profile, you'll find a morale value. When you accrue more stress tokens than this value, there's a chance that your unit will become demoralized and start to flee the battlefield. 
even if it doesn't flee, you will then need to take a stress test to activate that unit, say if you're attacked in combat. If you fail a test to fight in combat, then your unit is too shaken up and won't do anything, meaning that you may end up standing there as you're hacked to death without responding, and if you do survive, your guy will then run for the hills. Amazing. Managing your stress is therefore so important, but what can you do about it? Well, at the start of every round, you will remove one stress token from every unit as standard. You may then remove stress tokens by spending skills to rest, or by using abilities which other units have. For example, the amazing and incredibly feminine War Surgeon has the first aid skill, which removes a stress token automatically, and can then remove extra stress if you hit a switch on your dice roll. Yes, I know that the War Surgeon is a female. Thank you to all of you who reminded me. Now, let's get into a turn. When you activate a unit, you may choose to complete up to two short skills or a single long skill. Infinity players right now are having some serious deja vu. In practice, this lets you complete a move and something else. So a move and attack, a move and a skill, like the first aid skill on the still ladylike war surgeon, or a move and a move. This means you can't attack and attack. Move has to feature in there somewhere. When it comes to long skills, the first one that I've picked up was Assault. That's the movement value in brackets on the profile, followed by an attack. We also know that there is a rest skill, which I believe will be a long skill and seems to remove negative effects from units. The attack skill includes both ranged and close combat attacks. I would also expect there to be a spell casting short skill as well. When it comes to movement, we're using the stride system, which is a 15 millimeter per stride measure. However, in game it's done with these templates. Each unit has two movement values on their profile, which you can move the unit in a single movement skill. The template of the first value is placed against the base of the unit. The unit is moved to the other end. Then the template of the second value is placed and the unit is again moved to the other end. This means that you actually move your two movement values plus the width of your base of your unit. This means that your actual movement is your two movement values plus the size of your unit's base. It's not as simple as measurement strides multiplied by 1.5 millimeters. You'll also note that this means your units aren't moving around corners. You can turn in the space between the first and second movement values, but otherwise it's straight lines all the way. That's also the same with the charge. If you want to run screaming into an enemy, you need to be able to get into base to base with one of the models in that unit without going through other minis or terrain. When the violence train starts down the track, it ain't stopping or turning. When it comes to moving a unit with multiple miniatures, you only need to measure the unit leader. Get that one in position, then the rest of the unit can be placed within two strides of the unit leader. This makes it much quicker and easier to move groups of minis around the board. No measuring everyone to get them in place. Interestingly, however, any mini in a unit can be measured to for ranged attacks, spells and charges. You don't need to target the unit leader. This does make the positioning of the rest of the minis important, especially as you can use a unit to screen out possible charges to the units behind much easier than if you were using the true movement of all miniatures. So if all of your guys are previously stood behind the leader and you move the leader up, you can then move all of the guys in front of him up to a range of two strides to act as a screen if needed. Close combat is a relatively straightforward affair. In the most basic form, the attacker rolls their attack dice taken from their profile the defender rolls their defense dice, also taken from their profile. You then subtract the total number of successful defenses from the total number of successful attacks, and then the unit takes wounds, equaling the total attacks remaining. If you don't have any attacks left, all damage is blocked. Miniatures are then removed based on how many wounds are done. So, for example, bucklermen have two wounds. If they receive three wounds, you would remove one miniature and mark that a second miniature has lost a wound. Once melee combat is resolved, the loser takes a stress token and moves back their first movement value. The attacker may then follow up to stay in engagement with them. That's the basics. In addition to this, when you roll your dice, you may achieve a roll which lets you trigger switches. For example, bucklermen can generate a defensive block when attacking if they roll a hollow exclamation mark. Switches are, however, a choice, with the attacker choosing whether or not to activate this first, then the defender choosing whether to activate this. 
Ranged attack is much the same, but the loser doesn't seem to need to fall back when the wounds are caused, and switches are not used, unless the attacker's ranged weapon has a specific switch built in. Now, let's do a bit of wild speculation. Magic has yet to be discussed in any detail, but let's look at what we know. The two spellcasters that we have profiles for both have a much higher willpower than other units. Their spells then have a black dice modifier, with attacking spells also having attack dice. What I think happens is that the spellcaster needs to roll against their willpower modified with the black dice to actually cast the spell. This can, based on what you roll, accrue some tinge. Tinge seems to be like stress, but for spellcasters, with potentially modifiers and risk casting spells based on how much tinge your spellcaster has so far in the game. If you successfully cast, then either the effects are applied or the attack dice are rolled with the defender rolling defense dice as usual. This is, as I say, total speculation, but it seems to bear out what we've seen so far. Next, we have the no one left behind phase. This is where you move any units who haven't activated this round. They then must move up the field towards the enemy. You can't use this to retreat or pull back. Some units have abilities which trigger in this phase, like the War Surgeon, who can heal anyone that she walks by or who walks by her. Finally, we're to winning the game. Each scenario has a narrative element which we expect to define victory conditions. What we do know is that these conditions are varied with the ability to win through combat, tactical, and potentially other types of objective. This is nice. It lets you build armies based around how you like to play rather than just prepping for a smash fest in the middle of the board. And at this point, that's pretty much all we know about the rules. Have you picked up on anything we've missed? If so, fire it into the comments. Also, let us know what you think of our predictions. Does the system sound good to you? Are you ready to play? Thanks to CCG Winkle for supporting the series, and also to our patrons and YouTube channel members for their awesome support. We couldn't do this without you guys. If you liked the video, please give us a like, subscribe, and share it with your family, friends, and cat. This all helps tell YouTube that we're doing a good job. Also, please consider joining our Patreon or channel membership, like Joe Rogers, for exclusive videos and other goodies. We'll see you in the next video. For now, thanks for watching. See you soon.